So it is a great pleasure to welcome everybody, in particular Professor Christian Elis from the University of Bamberg in Bavaria. <clears throat> he studied biology, philosophy, and art history at the universities of Heidelberg and Konstanz in Germany and gained a DPhil in philosophy from Oxford University in 1995, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. He then held various academic positions at the University of Essen in Germany, as well as Eindhoven and Delft in the Netherlands, before he became Professor of Philosophy at the University of Bamberg in 2008. He's also been awarded several visiting research positions, for example, in Hamburg and in Cambridge. Among his areas of specialization are first, political anthropology, second, ethics of influence and man manipulation, third, evolution and ethics, and fourth, philosophy of architecture. On these and other areas, he has published very widely. For reasons of time, I would just single out his monographs. Um, the first book was on Darwin, um, published in 1991 and co-authored with Vittorio Hösle, another famous philosopher. Then um, the PhD thesis, I think, was published in 2003, The Grounds of Ethical... That was the PhD thesis, right? The Grounds no, of Ethical Judgment. No, that was judgment. a habilitation. PhD oh, okay. was yeah. only published sorry, in sorry papers. Sorry for the confusion, mm -hmm. yeah. And then in 2006, um, you wrote a book on philosophical anthropology in the biological age on the convergence of ethics and nature. Together with Nicholas Ray, he wrote Philosophy of Architecture, published in 2014. And it's, it's a great pleasure to say that Nicholas is also here today. A warm welcome to you, Nick. Now, one of the many reasons why we have invited Professor Elise to be part of our lecture series is the Institut Mensch und Ästhetik, of which he is one of the founders. The Institute, based at the University of Bamberg and Coburg in Bavaria, investigates the relationship between architecture and human life, to put it in very simple terms. It takes a special interest in the interplay between aesthetics, biology, culture or civilization, biography and holistic health. It goes without saying that Professor Elise's guest lecture today is directly related to the research agenda of this institute, and we are thrilled to have him here. The title of his lecture is Buildings as an Inner Balm, Aesthetics and Resilience. We are very much looking forward to your guest lecture, Professor Elise. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for your kind words. Um, and since Nick is here, I can maybe link what I'm trying to do today to some previous things we've done together. I think we can fairly say that one of our main ambitions was to translate some of the traditional continental intuitions into a more analytic and rational language. Um, philosophy of architecture has been dominated quite massively by the ideas of Heidegger about dwelling. And there are people like Carsten Harris, who translated that into a quite reasonable language because Heidegger himself is rather dark. But the sort of driving idea of what Nick and I did in our previous book was to go even further with a kind of analytic rigor in grasping that there is something very unique and special about architecture, about living, and about dwelling, about living well in any such environment, but that this is easily just words and we need some more categories and possibilities to analyze better what it actually actually means that we dwell or that it, something is good for us and so the title in a sort of slightly poetic form tries to um, capture that and is an attempt to um, show you the kind of thoughts I have partly um, in that institute how to make that a kind of fertile research program, what architecture means for humans. Now I swap um, to my PowerPoint. I hope, moment, uh, for a moment I must, sorry, I hope that it works. And want to begin by introducing you to some examples of buildings that could be seen as an inner barn. Um, To philosophers, um, it's always difficult because philosophers are sort of the masters of imagination association. So I try to give you a clear sort of train of thought. Um, 
what I want to do is I give you examples of meaningful architecture. Then I want to talk about um, what constitutes meaningful architecture. And here I have two subdivisions. After that, I ask what is beneficial of architecture for our soul or what could that be? And finally, I try to sort of come back to my original examples. So let us begin by looking at cases that are more or less well known, um, examples of meaningful architecture. I begin with this little, well, it's for our times, it's a big house um, at Husum, which the Germans of you will know, it's at the North Sea. And that is where Theodor Storm grew up. And he, um, he lost his parents rather early. He grew up with his grandmother, mainly in this house, and in some way loved it and loved the city. And that is the city of Husum, where he grew up. Now, I've taken on purpose a black and white photo because he describes the importance of this town for himself in a very famous poem, which captures a sort of crucial aspect of why architecture could have such a meaning. And now I'm reading this because there are now three, as I learned here, I mean two, Christina also understands German, at least she indicated something. Um, I read it in German, but give you the English translation so that you get the poem in which he describes the experience of his hometown. And it's a very famous one. You probably will know it, Torsten. Am grauen Strand, am grauen Meer und seitab liegt die Stadt. Der Nebel drückt die Stecher schwer und durch die Stille braust das Meer eintönig um die Stadt. Es rauscht kein Wald, es schlägt im Mai kein Vogel ohne Unterlass. Die Wandergans mit hartem Schrei nur fliegt in Herbstesnacht vorbei, am Strande weht das Gras. Doch hängt mein ganzes Herz an dir, du graue Stadt am Meer. Der Jugendzauber für und für ruht lächelnd noch auf dir, auf dir, du graue Stadt am Meer. So here we have a fascinating poetic example of what architecture could mean for something, someone. It's a humble place. It's sort of single brick uh, houses, small harbor, absolutely non-important, non-spectacular city. And he describes this in all, he describes the city in all its grayness and boredom, but it doesn't matter. My whole heart belongs to you because of all the memories of youth, the charms of youth forevermore linger with you, smiling on you, gray town beside the sea. So we have this deep meaning that the town gets for him through experiences he had as a child, through growing up in this house with his beloved grandmother, having had a childhood which in many ways fulfilled him, and you can see it in many of his works, that childhood was an important period for his life, and that the memory transforms and the positive memory transforms the place so that even the great town becomes deeply meaningful for him. I look at a different second example, which is for the British audience chosen and is about 60 years later. The poem was 1852. Now we are moving to E.M. Forster, Howard's End, probably one of the most famous houses um, of English literature. And you can see at the corner, it's not obviously, it's a novel, but this is the house in which Forster grew up and with including the um, tree, which you find next to the house was very much the model for his house in the book. You know, probably the story. Um, it's a story of two families. There is the Schlegel family, which had moved to Britain from Germany, and there is the Wilcox family, 
which represents the sort of driving dynamics of economy. They are very successful business people. And it's a bit also a tension between a kind of the Schlegel idealism. I mean, they are called Schlegel for good reasons. Schlegel, one of the represents of uh, the kind of romantic idealist tradition, and that is confronted with a kind of materialism. And the house in this has a special role. It is the house which um, in the end is given to Margaret Schlegel, one of the Schlegel sist uh, siblings, when she marries finally Mr. Wilcox, the widow, widower. And in, in that sense, the house becomes for her a place where she connects the two families, the two traditions, and finds a certain harmony. The book itself is a long description of um, difficulties, challenges, um, up to this point, because it was, in a way, not expected that it would work. But for, <clears throat> in the book, Helen Schlegel, one of her sisters, says, in these English farms, and it's portrayed as a little farmhouse, if anywhere, one might see life steadily and see it whole group in one vision its transitoriness and its eternal youth connect connect without bitterness until all men are brothers the two words which i sort of highlighted here is whole and connect and both play an important role in the book itself the house seems to have the meaning of a kind of wholeness it kind of unity, and it's also a place of connection, and that can be sort of spelled out very concretely. They do finally connect in the house, but the house in some ways can also be a place of disconnection. But this is the meaning which we find here. It is a connection between, you could say, traditional and modern values, and also it is an ideal home, and there is all the ideas of Foster about the country life and so forth. The book is also, I'm, I read it when I studied in England, and it was for me a key to understand the love of the English uh, or British for their countryside, for that dwelling in the countryside. And this book is really um, putting this all together in this sort of ideal vision. Let us turn to a different example. This is again the house from the back, but let us move on and for the royalists amongst you i've taken this picture i hope you identify your um let's say your royal family nick i don't ask you because i'm sure you don't want to identify them and um, can you see my cursor is that visible yeah okay here she is of course this is queen victoria but what is much more important is and um, this young chap here this is kaiser wilhelm the German emperor. And this is Alfred, one of her sons. And he became the Duke, or he was then the Duke of Coburg, Sachsen, and Gotha. Because, as you know, Albert, her husband, um, was the brother of the Duke of Coburg. And he was then one of their ch children who became. Duke in Coburg in Germany because the family had no male heir. So the whole picture was taken in Coburg, not at the building I want to look at, but just to give you the impression of the time. And I thought you might find that interesting that this is really sort of all the people who, who mattered at those days. I mean, you're far, a Tsar of Russia, everyone is in here. And around that time, Germany was obviously rich, prosperous, driving, growing. And so we want to turn to a school which was built a few years later. 1907, the School of the Holy Cross was built. The name um, just signifies that it is close to a church of the Holy Cross. It was not a church school or anything. It was just a town school, but just had this name. And here you find a very interesting and fascinating form of architecture. It is um, an architecture which is not 
I mean, roughly it's called Art Deco um, Jugendstil. Um, and it has some of its inspirations, but it is also still using more historicist elements. We'll look at details in a moment. I just want to give you the general impression. And what you see is it's not symmetrical. It is rather monumental, but it's much ornamented. And if you look, it is a bit like a little city rather than one building. I mean, you have turrets, you have tower houses, and this the central house looks like a new house sort of which comes out of your house. This is actually the gym. The school at those days was one of the most modern school buildings in Germany. It had um, not only a sport hall, it had a kitchen, it had showers. It had even um, a central heating, which was rather rare in, 19, in 1907. And then had air conditioning, a kind of air conditioning for each schoolroom, where warm air, fresh warm air was pumped into each schoolroom. So it was a very modern school, but I'm looking at examples of meaningful architecture. So just imagine you are a schoolboy or a schoolgirl entering the school. Now, actually, you must be a schoolboy because the gate I show you now is the male, is the boy's entrance. Boys and girls had separate entrances. And here you see children around 1910, uh, 1910, 1910, who play in front of the school. And what you see is quite impressively a sort of castle-like structure that is welcoming them. You see, the, see this gate and you even might recognize a little knight here. So the interesting idea is that you begin by welcoming the child in an environment which is sort of medieval. It's the castle. And when you look at the little soldier at the gate, you can see that the boy who was still playing with his toy castle in his home is now on the way to school. So you have all the kind of pictures, images, ideas of a childhood, which is now moved as a kind of the next step of growing up to welcome them into the building. And if we look again, you see there's a knight, there's a bird, I will show in a second, and there is another guy. And here is the third one, which we'll see, because we have, in a way, a little story here. On the left, we have the knight. And it's, of course, full of um, fun and, and humor. It's a boy playing a knight, but fighting a dragon. And then you have the kind of marabou stork. It's a bird on top of the gate, which symbolizes wisdom. And then you have the learned boy who's carrying the knowledge of the world. And you have the farmer's boy. So in some sense, you have the way he starts as the playful child, goes into school, gets wisdom, and then works in the society. But you can also see it as the three um, groups of people in Plato's ideal state. You have the soldiers, you have the intellectuals or the philosophers, and you have the workers. So the images try to move the child into it, but at the same time, give them already a meaningful story of what to expect. The girls' gate on the side is a bit more simple because the life seems to be just between um, schooling and doing knitting work. And here you have the crest of the house of Coburg. It's not of the Duke, but of the city of Coburg. The whole school is built with these images. This is a well in the um, schoolyard, is basically the fairy tale of the girl with a frog. Here you have another fairy tale as an image. And all details are playful. Like here, this is a part of the air conditioning, but it's built like a little turret. And if you enter the school, the meaningful message goes on because it is artificially high. You must climb up several staircases to go into the school. So the little schoolboy who has entered the big gate must climb up. So he gets, in a way, 
the experience of it's not too easy to go to a school and to learn and to acquire knowledge. But on the other hand, you also find elements like this, which looks more like a kind of garden art or so a place for leisure time in the garden. And it's sort of obviously sort of stimulating ideas of a nice time, a playful time or a relaxed time, a civilized time. So you do not threaten the child, you welcome it, you give a clear message, but you always combine it inside with images of it's worthwhile, it's a good place to find other people to sit down and to enjoy knowledge and learning. The message, the meaningful message, and I'm sorry that the pictures are all a bit um, odd, I, they are reconstructing it at the moment. So I made a collage and it was not possible to get the full building. But what is interesting is we have the entrance here and in some ways you have it as a medieval structure. It looks like a little castle, which you have to enter. If you go further, you see two things which are interesting. Firstly, you see, as I've said before, you enter a city, not only a building. You enter, in a way, a way of a shared communal life where people live together as houses in a city. So the message is what you enter is, is, has many facets, has many individual possibilities. And what is even more interesting, if you look at this structure, it looks as if the medieval part is ruined and the modern part grows out of it or a more modern one. So this is another message meaning which is given, namely that the kind of childhood entrance, the medieval time, gives way to this different structure. And that looks not exactly medieval. It's very hard to give it a clear stylistic name, but it is basically a kind of um, mixture of elements of an architecture around 1800, 1820, early 19th century. So it is looking backwards from 1910, but it is giving the imagination of a city from around 1800, 1850. And I think the idea that is given is that also learning begins in the kind of medieval time, in ancient times, and then you move up to the kind of peak of um, German civilization as it was seen then, I think, the Goethe time. Here you have all the modern classics. This is, in these buildings, you would expect Herrn Schlegel, you would expect Goethe and Frau von Stein having a cup of tea or whatever. So you have the building itself telling also the story of a Bildungsgang, of an education towards what was, I think, so even rightly seen as the peak of culture and civilization of the German tradition in the upper building. So in many ways, the building, sorry, um, tells a story to the child. It has meaning by providing him a kind of a master plan for his own life and for the education he, is, he can expect in this building. Let us move quickly to another one. You all know that probably, it's Sussex, Virginia Woolf, um, and it's where she worked. And that's the way she transformed the house into a working shed. And she famously wrote, that in uh, in her essay, A Room for One's Own, that a woman, woman must have money and a room of her own if she is to write fiction. Here you have a very active way of giving meaning to a building. It is a way of making it, changing it, transforming it into something that you, that has a deep meaning into your life and making it a space for what has meaning into your life, in your life namely writing. I want to look now a bit more analytically at these examples. What does it mean to appropriate and integrate architecture 
and that is the way I want to spell out meaningful. What meaningful means is to be able to appropriate it and integrate it. Now let us um, look very simple, it's sort of a, a very simple representation of what happens if we experience architecture. We begin with a building. There's a given structure, something we experience. So we need the experiencing occupant, user, um, whoever um, is confronted with the building. And in many ways, he reacts. It's not simply that he um, is a passive uh, receiver of uh, sense material. No, he reacts in many ways. Um, he puts things in a context. He says, ah, this is um, classic language of architecture, or this is a modernist building, or this is a train station. He puts it into conceptual categories. He walks in it. So we have very practical forms of reactions. Um, but we must begin to answer to it. And that can lead to what I call appropriation and integration of the building. And that means integration into my life, into who I am. Because it's not only that we respond to it, but by responding, a story begins. We could also talk about a dialogue. In modern literature, you sometimes find a long discussion of correspondence, resonance, or similar terms, which try to describe that something is happening. But for the occupant, I think the best way to put it is that there's an appropriation and integration. Let us look again at the examples. When we have um, Virginia Woolf, she starts with a garden shed. That is the given object. And it has, luckily, windows. Now she reacts. She perceives, she evaluates, but she clears away the tools and arranges the room to a study. And that leads to a form of appropriation and integration because she redefines the space. It's now a new room, a room of her own that emerges. And it's a room which is very much her room. It's not any room. It's the deeply meaningful room for her because it is a room close to nature. It's very protected and private. It's separate from the house. It's a free space for creativity. And she surely also likes the idea or liked the idea that it is a rather unconventional place to stay. So the appropriation and integration is the central point where we can say that a building becomes meaningful. Let us look at the examples. The childhood of Theodor Storm. The appropriation and integration happened by him seeing this place, this town, as a kind of constitutive part of his own life. It is the place of his childhood and the magic of the childhood comes from it. That means for him, it is still the central source of his identity, but also values, norms of all that that give quality to his life. And so you find lots of images about this magic that is still on it, the magic of the youth. So it's also a place that gives him a meaning for the own experience of his life as something in time. In the school, the appropriation and integration ideally happens in seeing what the building tells you as your own way. So seeing it something you live through, and schools are interesting buildings because you live through them through years and you enter and leave them again. So it's not a permanent dwelling place, but it's a shaping place. And so in many ways, the meaning it can get to you for the individual child could be ideally exactly what it tries to tell you with the symbols, pictures, images, and sculptures. Namely, it welcomes the child as still the little knight, the child from his home leads it to the dream world of a castle into 
a Bildungsgang into a form of education so that he can leave it as a different person, as a citizen of a city that is seen on the top of the building. And similarly, we had lots of appropriation and integration in Howard's End. Um, for example, the way you finally can hope for reconciliation between a modern uh, market economy way of thinking and a love for countryside and nature, the two families who represent these things can find here a shared place expressed, of course, in the marriage of uh, Wilcox with uh, Margaret Schlegel. So here the building, again, is integrated and appropriated into a changed life because both sides, in a way, alter their life. It's not that the two are simply the same people they were at the beginning. No, through the process, through the house, they meet in the house as altered people who were willing, who were able to connect to a new whole. Again, a form of appropriation and integration. I gave my reflections the title <clears throat> that it is good for the soul. And so I should say very briefly what I mean when I say soul. Obviously, soul is not exactly a term that psychologists use these days. Um, it's um, uh, very few do it. Um, it might be might not be ideal that psychology has given up any notion for it because I think we do need some term to grasp what we could call the unity of the individuality, the dynamic unity of the individual. Um, something that we all experience that in some way we are one. I am Christian and I am the person who had a coffee an hour ago and is now drinking tea, is talking, whatever. I am the one who had my childhood in a little place called Schlitz and I have family members I remember. I have, I'm the one who looks to the future, who's expecting things to do. I'm the one who loves people, who has a wife, family, children, friends, and so forth. All of that is the me who has it the dynamic unity of individuality and it binds that's the first bullet point here our individual characteristics experiences memories as well as our relationships values dreams and aspirations together including what we want to be and achieve it integrates them um towards a whole sorry and unifies them towards a whole so we start with a sort sort of undisputable experience of wholeness or unity and an essential element of this is what we, in a way, aim at. Aristotle, in his um, analysis of the soul, put this in the first place. The goal, the telos, is that characterizes living beings, even animals and plants. But in humans, it is the telos that is conscious of itself. So the inner unity is constituted not only by what memories we have and the aspects we know of ourselves, but ultimately of what we aim at. And I, am, I can't argue for this in detail here, but I think it is sort of a more or less automatic consequence from the fact that we are beings that act towards the future, that are pointing towards the future. We must always reflect on what we want to do next. We are sort of thrown into this condition we cannot avoid it but it's also a fantastic condition but we are always pointing at something it might be trivial it might be whatever but <clears throat> aristotle also observed that the overall goals are the main influences or the main shaping forces for this unity and we could when we ask what binds it all together this um, concept of a unity I think it is very um, interesting to look at concepts of the narrative self that have been developed in the last years. Though I don't follow the theory in all concepts, in all aspects, I think it is um, probably a good description that the way we bind our life together, the way we give meaning to the aspects that we have, the aspects 
the things we experience, the things we feel, our visions, dreams, values, we do it in a kind of story form. We don't see it as a kind of mechanical, physical um, process. We see it as something where things are for something. Now, give you an example. When you now just remember for a moment your primary school. Remember the moment when you entered primary school or when you saw it first. I think you cannot avoid seeing it as a kind of film, as a kind of story. There is you, um, little Christina, walking to the gate of a school building and being maybe afraid of all these people and this big building or being very proud with all the sweets and delights she got for, or at least that's a German tradition where you get all the kinds of sweet stuff um, for school and the dentists are very happy about that. So we see it as stories. We don't see it as a kind of fact. We cannot memorize facts as a kind of, as if they were written on a piece of paper. No, they are embedded in processes, activities. And if you try to see any aspect of your life, you will probably inevitably see it as part of a story. So I think that is a very good way to at least make it more clear to ourselves what that unity means for us. It is kind of a story. And it is a story we continue. And I think that's why Paul Ricoeur is very interesting here, who said, we can understand our life as a kind of narrative that we try to seek throughout our lives. We want to make me meaning, give meaning to the things we experience. So everything we see, we experience, um, we include into the narrative. And if something cannot be included, it's worrisome. And so it's interesting to look at tension, appropriation, and resilience, and then I'm at the end. If we conceive the kind of phenomenology of the individual as presenting us to ourselves as a unity that binds itself together in a narrative form, it looks a bit too maybe um, smooth, harmonious. Because we are not that strong unity. We all have different um, tensions in us. We have different strives. We are, have ambiguities. We have not simply a unity in a strict sense. No, we are not static. We always have discord, disruption, surprises, ambivalences, and novelties. And that is good so. Because <clears throat> on the one side, without disruption, there cannot be any growth. Without identity crisis, we cannot find a more mature, a grown-up identity. Think about puberty. Puberty is so important. I tell myself all the time when my children are going through it. Um, because only when you go through a puberty, you can become mature. So the, the crisis that we experience makes us think twice, makes us reflect better, makes us reshape our values, our ideals, our life form in order to include the new experiences we have and try to find a new narrative which deals with them. But of course, some experiences are horrible. They disturb us and don't fit in and destroy us. So, I mean, the praise of the tension should not overlook the fact that sometimes tensions can be catastrophes for people. I don't need to give you examples here, I think. I just want to sum it up by saying we are, the human soul seems a dynamic entity, unity, that on the one side needs stability because only then it can preserve its identity and unity. It needs to, in some sense, remain the one it is. I must feel myself identical with myself over time, but. At the, on the other side, it must always be open for change and growth. That is the dynamic element in the human identity and unity. And in um, 
in health science. Um, this is discussed at the moment a lot with the term of resilience. Resilience is described, I'm here following Nico Kohls, a colleague of our institute. In his definition, resilience is a stable property of a system's tolerance to fluctuations while simultaneously remaining open to balanced evolution in the sense of development and learning. So it's a stable property of a system's tolerance to fluctuations. So on the one side, we need stability. We need a kind of robustness that, that not any new experience sort of uh, puts that, uh, makes us lose our unity and, and destroys us. But we must remain open to balanced evolution in the sense of development and learning, change and growth, as I called it. Coming to the end, <clears throat> what does it mean architecture as a soothing balm for the soul? If this very rough picture of how we understand ourselves and how we understand also resilience and therefore um, the need for experiences that make us grow by being able to appropriate and integrate them, we look back to architecture. Architecture, obviously, is one of the central constitutive parts of our experience. Not only when we go to school the first time, but our entire life is basically within rooms, buildings, architecture. What is then a good architecture for humans? I think a good architecture for humans is an architecture which allows exactly that growth, which is stimulating and stabilizing at the same time, which is allowing appropriation and integration. And I know these words are now very general, but I think it can only be become more concrete in concrete examples. I mean, if we look at this dining room, one of the most beautiful dining rooms I know, you have all that you need. You have a building that makes an offer to you to react. You can have a glass of wine and eat at the table. You can withdraw to this wonderful corner sofa and sit down and you have a contact to nature. Nature seems to come in. So you start a dialogue with nature. You, and this is obvious in the picture, you make it your own room. You put individual bits and pieces into it. This is a family home. This is not uh, any exhibition or something. So the room must be um, appropriated, but not any room can easily be appropriated. And you have to make, let's say, as an architect, ideally an offer to provide space that gives the individual a chance to react to it, to integrate it, and to live a good and fulfilled life. I know it has become, in the end, very general. And that is the problem. Saying that is one thing, but looking in detail how you can shape a sofa for example, like this, that allows you to sit with a cup of tea. You can see two people sitting sort of at the at opposite corners or a loving young couple moving very close together or an elderly chap having a nap on it or children playing on it when it rains, climbing up, looking out of the window. I think this is a place which makes exactly what good architecture should do. It's a room which is balm for the soul. Thank you.